Okay, so let's uh, dive back into um, enzymes. Uh, there are a lot of concepts with enzymes. So if I'm going too fast or if you have questions, please do feel free to uh, stop me and, and ask because um, these are rather abstract concepts and I think it's important to get these planted firmly in your heads in terms of something real and tangible, which is why I try to make analogies as much as I can uh, for you to be able to understand those. So that's important to do. All right, now your book presents things in a little bit different order than I would, but I'm going to go ahead with what your book uh, has done here, uh, which I think is sort of a left turn at this point, and then come back and talk about some more enzyme parameters. So at this point, your book talks about mechanisms, general mechanisms of catalysis. These general mechanisms of catalysis are sort of along the lines of what I talked about with respect to transition state, but they're not exactly. So um, we need to understand what those mechanisms are. Okay? So enzymes, as I said, um, do what they do because they have properties that chemical catalysts don't have. And one of those properties is exhibited very clearly in the discrepancies between these two models I'm getting ready to describe to you. So these models explain or attempt to explain how enzymes work. All right? They are related to the flexibility thing I talked about before. You'll see why in a second. So the first model I want to talk about was the, is the traditional model that was used to explain how, how enzymes work. And it's an older model. It's called the Fisher model, F-I-S-C-H-E-R. And the Fisher model was very good at explaining one thing, and it still is. It was very good at explaining how it is that enzymes bind to their substrates. The Fisher model says the following. It says that the enzyme fits with the substrate like a lock fits with its key. It tells us, first of all, that enzymes have very specific structures that they will bind and catalyze a reaction on. It's not inaccurate in what it says there. However, the Fisher model is deficient in that it doesn't tell us anything at all about how an enzyme does what it does. The other model, as you will see, is a bit in conflict with the Fisher model. Okay? And you'll see why. And you'll also see why it's actually a better model explaining how it is that enzymes work. The Fisher model is pretty good at explaining what enzymes do, but not how they do it. Okay? So we see a substrate. We see the substrate has a specific shape. That specific shape has a corresponding complementary shape in the enzyme. The enzyme says, oh, I will let you in. And therefore, they make what's called the ES complex. The ES complex is simply the enzyme bound to the substrate. That's all it is. The reaction can only occur in the ES complex because if the enzyme hasn't bound to the substrate, there's no way for the reaction to be catalyzed. Okay? Now, the other model for explaining this is a more modern model, and it was proposed by Dan Koshland. There's a lot of evidence for it. It's called the induced fit, and it looks subtly different. Okay? Now, if you look carefully at this figure, what you see is that the enzyme has a shape for binding the substrate that is sort of like the substrate, but it only becomes complementary to the substrate after it is bound to it. Now, what this figure is showing you is what I've told you earlier in words. Enzymes are flexible. The flexibility is seen by the fact that the shape of this binding site actually changes in going over to here. The shape is changing. So the Koshland model, I'm going to put it in words, and then I'm going to say a little bit more about it. The Koshland model says this. It says that not only do enzymes change substrates, it says that substrates also transiently change enzymes. The reason that they're able to transiently change enzymes is because enzymes are flexible. Do enzymes have infinite flexibility? No, they don't. But there may be ranges 
of shapes of substrates that can bind because of that flexibility of the enzyme. Yes, sir? Does that imply that an enzyme can work for different substrates? Does that imply that an enzyme can work for different substrates? Some enzymes can, yes. Mm -hmm. And we saw that when we looked at, for example, trypsin. Trypsin could work with a substrate that had lysine. It could work with a substrate that had arginine. And when we see different substrates, it tells us that it's not a pure lock and key, okay? but that, in fact, there are some ranges of flexibility that are allowed here. Now, notice I said that the enzyme is transiently changed by the substrate. The enzyme binds the substrate, as we can see here, but what's happening going from here to the reaction, to catalyzing the reaction, let's say the reaction is it splits this guy in half. We get an AB and then we get a little C as something else. Once the enzyme releases the product, it goes right back to its natural state, which is over here. Now that's very important because the number one thing that I wager every single one of you learned in general chemistry, and this, this message comes across very well, is that a catalyst is a molecule that speeds up a reaction but is not changed in the process. What you see here is that there actually is a change in this catalyst. We don't have it in chemical catalysts. There actually is a transient change here, but it goes back to the same state, so nobody ever really realized it. Okay? So it's going back to its original state. In the meantime, look at this. Let's think about what is present here in this state compared to here in this state. The enzyme, if I'm letting the enzyme float around, the enzyme likes to be in this state right here. When the enzyme binds the substrate, it's put into this state. Do you suppose that this state where the substrate is bound is more strained? Right? It's kind of like having visitors in your house for a period of time. Right? It's really great at first, but god dang, when are they going to get out of here? Right? There's strain. And that strain causes things to happen. It causes things to happen in relationships, and it causes things to happen in enzymes. That strain turns out to be one of the driving forces of a reaction. That's a driving force for a reaction. That's kind of cool. OK. So the Fisher model tells us very good things about binding, but it doesn't tell the full picture, as you can see here. The binding actually does change the enzyme slightly, and that change in shape causes constraint that now favors the enzyme going through and catalyzing the reaction that the, react that the enzyme actually catalyzes. When the reaction is done, the enzyme is back to its original state, okay, and we're set. Okay. Make sense? So the Koshland induced fit model is a very important model for explaining the mechanism of enzyme reactions. And as you can see, it builds in this flexibility thing that I talked about before. All right. Well, I mentioned initial velocity determination to you. This is kind of a confusing uh, figure. But it tells us that if we do a series of reactions, the reaction I showed you before where I had varying um, uh, substrate concentrations. Let's imagine that instead of um, uh, doing this as different tubes, I did this over time. So instead of varying substrate concentration, I'm varying time. Okay? What I see then is S1 gives me a certain rate, S2 gives me a higher rate, S3 gives me a higher rate, S4 gives me a higher rate. But you can see each one of these concentrations is starting to level off. Why, is, why, are, those, why are those concentrations leveling off? Magic word? Equilibrium. They're reaching equilibrium. Before, they were reaching maximum velocity because we were varying substrate concentration. In this case, they're reaching equilibrium. And when they reach equilibrium, the concentration of product is not going to change over time, right? That's what equilibrium actually is. So this tells us, the only reason to show you this figure is that it tells us that we had darn sure better measure that initial velocity because if we wait too long, we're not going to see what we expect to see. We're going to be measuring reverse reaction as well. That's the VO, that's the maximum velocity, I'm sorry, that's the, the initial velocity that I talked about before. Okay, it's a minor point, but nonetheless, that's why it is there. All right.
Now, the next point is a very important one. By the way, I, I'm talking about something called the Michaelis-Minton model. I should, I should tell you what that means. The way that we're studying kinetics, measuring initial velocities, varying concentrations of substrate, fixed amounts of enzyme concentration, these things that I've already given you in terms of parameters are a standard way of studying enzyme, react, enzyme kinetics known as the Michaelis-Minton. They were the people who came up with these originally. Okay. So that's where their name comes from. Michaelis Minton model is they uh, sort of invented uh, this process that we're going through. There are other considerations, but for our purposes at the moment, we don't need them. The next thing on the agenda, however, is a very important parameter for us to understand. And that parameter is another characteristic of an enzyme. It's called the KM. So in order to understand the KM, we have to go back to our V versus S plot and understand what is going on with this. Okay. On the V versus S plot, we saw that as we increased the concentration of substrate, we got to a higher and higher uh, maximum velocity until we essentially reached a leveling out point where we had the enzyme saturated with substrate. Okay? If I wanted to try to describe the affinity that an enzyme has for a substrate, I would have to think about it in terms of velocity. The only thing I can measure in the test tube very readily is velocity. So if I want to measure the affinity, I need to measure it in terms of velocity. Well, what's affinity? Well, let's think back to that Koshland model. Okay? And let's think back to that Fisher model. The Koshland model showed us that we had a binding site that sort of looked like that substrate, but it didn't exactly look like it. Right? We could imagine that there might be other substrates that might more closely match the actual shape of that active site of the enzyme. That enzyme might like to bind them more than it bound one that it had to change itself very much for. Right? That enzyme would have two different affinities, one that, substrate that it likes to bind and one substrate that it yawns and binds when it bumps into it. I want to understand the enzyme's affinity for its substrate, how much it likes to grab a hold of the substrate. So that's what KM helps us to measure. So I need to explain a little bit to you. The only thing I've got to measure affinity is velocity. Let's imagine that I said, well, okay, I want to measure affinity of this enzyme. Let's just measure the Vmax. Well, there's a couple problems with that. One is Vmax is a variable for an enzyme. Okay, okay well, let's measure Kcat. Well, Kcat's telling me turnover number, but it turns out it doesn't tell me very much about affinity. We'll see, we'll see that in just a little bit. So I need to think about velocity in a very different way. Let's say for a given set of tubes, instead of measuring Vmax, I measure uh, another parameter. Okay? So I'm interested in if I, let's imagine, uh, back up, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here. Let's imagine I want to I wanna know the affinity. So the affinity is going to be related to how much substrate it takes to what I would describe as wake up the enzyme. Something that has, the enzyme has low affinity, it's going to take a lot of substrate before the reaction gets going very far. Something that has high affinity, the enzyme's going to be grabbing it as soon as it can, it doesn't take very much substrate. Everybody understand that? So high affinity means that it won't take very much substrate concentration to get to a certain velocity. Low affinity means it's going to take a ton of it before the enzyme wakes up and says, oh, I'm going to catalyze a reaction. All right, now, so I did get ahead of myself. Now, now I've got that set up. We have that in mind. We think, well, okay, let's use Vmax. Well, Vmax turns out not to be very good because we only reach Vmax when we get to an infinite amount of substrate. So all enzymes are going to have a high substrate concentration to get to Vmax. That's not going to tell us a bloody thing. Instead, we measure the substrate concentration it takes to get to Vmax over 2. And this turns out to be a very, very useful number. We're not saturating the enzyme with substrate. And it turns out that if we measure the amount of substrate that it takes for an enzyme to get to Vmax over 2, we get something very interesting. We see exactly what I just told you. Enzymes that have high affinity for their substrate will have a low, this, is called, this, this, this parameter is called KM, 
high affinity, low KM. Low KM means it doesn't take very much substrate concentration to get the reaction to Vmax over 2. Conversely, things that have low affinity take a lot of substrate to get to Vmax over 2. Two very different types of reactions. Okay? KM, and one of the places students, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, one of the places where a good number of you are going to screw up on the exam, <coughs> KM is not Vmax over 2. KM is the substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2. They're very different things. KM is a substrate concentration, not a velocity. It is the substrate concentration right here that gives Vmax over 2 right here. Now, even though we're measuring Km from something that is not a characteristic of an enzyme, it turns out that Km is a characteristic of an enzyme. I can compare Kms between different enzymes. Affinity is a characteristic of an enzyme if you think about it. Affinity itself doesn't vary with concentration. Velocity varies with concentration, but affinity does not. Affinity is how much that enzyme wants to grab it, and that has nothing to do with concentration. So Km is a measure of the enzyme's affinity for its substrate. It is, in fact, the substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2. OK, questions about that? You guys are the quietest group? OK. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. KCAT? OK. So KCAT um, is simply a, another way of looking at velocity. And instead of measuring that velocity in terms of a concentration of product, it's a way of measuring amount of product per amount of enzyme. And that's the reason that KCAT is characteristic of an enzyme, because it tells us for each enzyme what the enzyme is doing. Vmax only tells us what is happening in a solution, and that solution depends on the enzyme concentration. In other words, so there's no enzyme component in Vmax. And since I can change the enzyme from one experiment to the, to the next, then I don't have that, um, uh, that consistency in terms of what an enzyme is doing. Because I can change Vmax by changing concentration of enzyme, I'm not really learning much about that particular enzyme. However, when I take the, constant, when, when I take the concentration of enzyme into consideration, which is what I do with KCAT, the concentration of the enzyme now disappears from the equation. And I'm only left with the characterization of the individual enzyme molecule. So a, a KCAT of 1,000 molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second tells me something about how fast that enzyme is able to go. That's different from what Vmax tells me. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. OK. Well, isn't the KCAT again? KCAT is equal to the uh, Vmax divided by the concentration of enzyme. So what we see, like I said, is that we have the concentration of product divided by the concentration of enzyme, the two concentrations cancel. Concentration cancels concentration. And we're left with numbers. And that's where we get this 1,000 per, per, 1, per second. It means 1,000 molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. Does that make sense? OK. Now, I'm throwing a lot of terms at you here today. And I can understand that probably you're not going to absorb it as I'm saying it here. Okay? And that's why I want you to go home tonight and think about these. Um, as always, if you have questions and you want to come in and ask them, I'll be happy to ask, answer them for you. Um, I'm also going to give you my cell phone number because um, I have no problems if you want to call me at home and uh, ask me a question. Okay? So, um, okay. I'm going to put it down here because if I put it up here, all the people in TV land will be calling me forever. So, okay. So, this will be a secret for the class, right? And you are welcome to call me any time of the day or night. I turn my phone off at night so I can assure you you won't bother me if you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you uh, repeat what you said? You said um, if you measure the amount of substrate it takes to get to Vmax over 2, it shows up? Okay, so if we measure this, if, okay, so if we measure the amount of substrate it takes for us to get to Vmax over 2, 
we have a measure of the enzyme's affinity for its substrate. Because it's going to take more substrate to get to Vmax over 2 if the enzyme doesn't have affinity, it's going to take less substrate to get to Vmax over 2 if the enzyme has high affinity. So we can think of the Km as inversely proportional to the enzyme's affinity. High Km, low affinity. Low Km, high affinity. OK. Now, those are the two most important parameters that we're going to discuss with respect to enzymes. Okay. All right, this introduces another concept I'll talk about in a second, OK? Let's look at a few numbers um, relevant to uh, Km, OK? So just like we can compile a table of Kcats, so too can we compile a, K, a, a, a table of Kms. And we see here that um, the uh, enzyme uh, chymotrypsin has a Km of about 5,000, whereas lysozyme has a Km of 6 micromolar. Okay? And notice it's a concentration because, again, it's a concentration of substrate to get to half Vmax. Uh, which of these two enzymes has a greater affinity for its substrate? The one that has 6, right? It doesn't take nearly as much to get to the same um, uh, v, uh, Vmax over 2 as it does for the other one. Well, we see quite widely varying ranges here. Here's 0.4 micromolar. Okay? high affinity for substrate. Here's 8,000 um, micromolar. That's uh, a relatively low. It's still not bad, but it's still a relatively um, uh, low affinity of the enzyme for its substrate. Notice here, there's carbonic anhydrase. That's the one we had the maximum rate, right? And I told you what? I said that KCAT wasn't going to tell us affinity. This is confirming it, OK? If KCAT told us affinity, then we'd say, oh, this guy's going to have the most affinity, but it doesn't. What does it tell us? It tells us that enzymes have various considerations. The rate with which they work may not be, and in fact are not related, is not related to the affinity they have for their substrate. That seems a little counterintuitive, but, it's, but they're unrelated. Rate and affinity are unrelated. Yes, Anisia. OK. OK. All right, so her question is a very good one. All right, her question is, well, what is it that makes this thing have such an incredibly high KCAT? Anybody want to try to tackle that one? It's a good question. OK, there, you probably know the answer to the question, but when you hear it, you'll, you'll, you'll understand. That's why I'm asking if anybody else gets it. What, what? Um, well, maybe the rate is so fast that if it had a really high affinity, it'd just do that. Like, it can do it really, really fast. So, so maybe that the rate is so high that the affinity doesn't matter. Actually, that's yeah. not, not quite the case. No. Nope. But not a bad guess. Yep. <laughs> is it more specific meaning? Well, I mean, affinity for that particular thing. So when it's nope. It's not, it's not specificity. Nope. OK, let's think about this. How did we get KCAT? How do we measure KCAT? It came from Vmax over concentration of enzyme. What's, hap what's present at Vmax? Saturating concentrations of substrate. Right? This is the reason we don't measure affinity at, at saturating concentrations, right? We're already measuring it at a place where we're already bombarding the enzyme with substrate. You see the answer? You see, does that make sense? OK? So we're measuring it at Vmax. We have already said that we're not going to take, we're not going to let affinity be a factor because we're going to flood it with so much substrate, it doesn't really matter. OK? So we have to use a different parameter when we want to measure affinity because if we bombard it, we know it's going to work great. Right? It's like if I come into this class and I say, you are going to have to give me a definition for KM, and I say this three times today, I will wager that bombarding you with that, you will say, I think he wants us to know the, the uh, substrate, uh, to know the definition of KM. Right? So it's important uh, to recognize that KCAT is doing something, is measured in a very different way 
than Km is. Okay? A good question. It's a very common question also. Yes? Was that a hint? <laughs> <laughs> was that a hint? Actually, I'll tell you this. Everything I say is a hint. You see? So <laughs> it's a hint <laughs> because students always say, well, you know, can you tell us the answers to the exam? And I say, I have been doing that the whole term. <laughs> so hopefully you get all the answers. I'd love to see you guys all make A's. So let's, let's, hope, let's hope this all happens. Okay. All right. So, so we see that enzymes can have varying affinities uh, for substrates. Um, we can look at turnover numbers, and there are some nice turnover numbers. Carbonic anhydrase here, 600,000. Depends a little bit how, who you read where. You see the book is even consistent in its own uh, use of the numbers. And we see something here I want to talk about that is going to be kind of cool. Students usually find this kind of interesting. All right. Now, what you see is a plot of the value of Kcat for an enzyme divided by the Km. Now, Kcat, an enzyme that we're, what we're looking at here is we're interested in understanding efficiency. Efficiency is yet another parameter. If I were to just ask you to tell me what an efficient enzyme would be, what would you think about? What would, what would help you to determine what an efficiency factor is for an enzyme? What's an efficient enzyme? Would it work fast? I think everybody would agree that an efficient enzyme would work fast, just like General Motors factory that produced a lot of cars uh, per day would be an efficient factory. Right? What else would we think about when we think about efficiency? It's not just speed, because efficiency implies other things. Quality, OK. Um, quality would be factor for General Motors, definitely. Uh, but since the products here are all going to pretty much be the same, um, that's not a factor, although it can be a factor if we think about um, DNA polymerases, making DNA, the quality of the product they make with respect to making errors is important. But in this case, it's not. Range of substrates? Range of substrates, that's actually an interesting uh, consideration. Um, and uh, while it tells us something about the flexibility of the enzyme, it doesn't tell us much about the efficiency. There's one other thing we have to think about with, with efficiency. What if I were to think about that General Motors factory? This, is, this analogy doesn't work perfectly, but I'll, but I'll hopefully get you thinking about it. What would make the General Motors factory efficient? Number of cars was one thing, but what's the other factor? Number of workers, Number of workers right? Okay. Well, this is where the analogy kind of falls down, but there is another factor we have to think about with enzymes. We don't have workers. What do we have? We have enzymes, but what else do we have? Substrates. Substrates. Okay. So an efficient enzyme is going to have the fastest possible velocity with the lowest possible Km, right? Because it's not going to take much substrate to get to maximum velocity. As we look at this table, we see, oh, wow, carbonic anhydrase, when we do that division, turns out to be pretty darn good. That's partly because its Kcat was so bloody high that it skewed everything. Now, you don't need to worry about what these numbers are, but I'll point out that to you that these numbers all are within uh, an order of magnitude or two of the same number. They're all within about, about 10 to the eighth. Okay? About 10 to the eighth. What these high numbers tell us is that these enzymes, which are extraordinarily efficient, these enzymes, okay, have a very high velocity and a very high affinity for substrate. They have both by that ratio. Okay? At least the ratio of those is high. Okay? It also tells us that no matter what, we've reached a maximum. We really don't see anything above 10 to the 9th, and that's about it. Okay? These guys turn out to be the most efficient enzymes that are in our cells. Now that's kind of cool, all right? But something even more important than that. These enzymes are what we describe as perfect. And they literally are perfect. We don't see many things in biology that are perfect, but these guys are literally perfect. What is a perfect enzyme? 
A perfect enzyme has reached its maximum K cat over Km, which these guys have all reached this high value, and they don't go any higher. Why doesn't that value go any higher? The reason it doesn't go any higher is these enzymes are all limited by the same thing. They're limited by how fast the substrate can diffuse into the active site. The rate of diffusion in water actually is the limiting factor for these enzymes. Now, if you think about that, it sort of makes sense. In fact, it's kind of hard to imagine. I've got carbonic anhydrase making a million per second. That means a million molecules of carbon dioxide have to bind in the active site of that enzyme per second. In, out, in, out, in. That's faster than I can think of. That's why that nanoscale is very difficult to think about. Now, a perfect enzyme is called a perfect enzyme not just because that number reaches a maximum. Okay? This theoretical maximum can be calculated on the diffusion rate of water, and in fact, it's, it's consistent with what we see here, that the diffusion of the substrate through water is limiting. If we could speed that rate up in the diffusion of the substrate through water, we actually could speed up and make these enzymes even more efficient. But water is pretty viscous stuff. The reason we call these perfect enzymes is not because they reach a theoretical maximum. But it turns out that if we try to mutate these enzymes, this is the perfect part, any mutation we put into them makes them less efficient. What that means is that from an evolutionary standpoint, these guys have evolved to this maximum efficiency. And any other changes that happen in them produce a less efficient enzyme. That's pretty phenomenal. The power of selection, of evolutionary selection, is incredible. It has made enzymes that are perfect. And when I say perfect, they literally are perfect. Now, the next question you're probably sitting there thinking is, are all enzymes perfect? Enzymes have done some pretty incredible things. And the answer is, no, they're not. Why aren't all enzymes perfect? Doesn't the cell want these things to go like crazy? And here's where another analogy comes in. Okay? You're sitting at home, and it's time to get some beer. Or maybe it's time to get some soft drinks. I don't know. And you live out on, uh, let's say you live down in Park West. Anybody here live at Park West? Okay, you live, well, let's say you live at Park West. And you need some beer. Okay? You go hop in your car, and you drive to Fred Meyer, and you get your beer. Okay? Your neighbor has a Porsche. And they live at Park West. And they know that Porsche can hit 200 miles per hour. So they hop in their Porsche, and they floor it to get to Fred Meyer. Are there going to be problems? Yes. And it's not just the illegal ones, but the problems are going to be they're going to run over people, they're going to have accidents, they're going to have the roads aren't built to take it, right? The speed, one of the reasons we have speed limits is to keep those problems from happening. One of the reasons that all enzymes aren't perfect is we can imagine that enzymes are so fast they might make too much of a product faster than we want it. That could be a problem. Imagine that the enzyme is catalyzing the breakdown of glycogen. <coughs> glycogen is a very important storage molecule in our bodies. We need bursts of energy. But we also need to turn those off very quickly. If this thing is going too fast and faster than we can control that, we may break all of our glycogen down before we have a chance to turn the reaction off. We don't want all of our enzymes to be perfect. Well, why do we have any, any of our enzymes perfect? There are various reasons. Okay? We'll talk about a couple of them in a bit. But one of the reasons is that sometimes enzymes catalyze reaction, reaction intermediates that are unstable. They've evolved perfectness to reduce the amount of time that unstable intermediate exists. It forms, and then the enzyme rapidly turns it into something else before it has a chance to fall apart. That's a very cool strategy. There are other strategies that cells have for why they have perfect enzymes. Cells are opportunists. They have evolved things that make it work for them. They don't want everything to be perfect, but they still want it to be fast enough to help them 
But they also want to be able to control it. Cells are what I describe as the ultimate control freaks. They are ultimate control freaks. They've got to have control over everything that's happening inside of them. Whenever they lose that control, they're in danger. Perfect enzymes could be a danger. OK. Questions on perfect enzymes? OK. All right. Now, let's talk about um, what's happening at the molecular level um, for enzymes. Okay, We've seen a schematic model of the um, cochlin induced fit. We've seen a schematic model of the fissure. But let's think about reactions in another way. Okay? An enzyme binds two substrates. It binds A, it binds B. It converts them into C plus D, for example. A plus B gives us C plus D. How does that enzyme do that? How does the enzyme bind it? Does it bind to A first and then B and release C and then D? Does it matter? Okay. And it turns out that for some enzymes it matters. For other enzymes it doesn't matter. And for yet another group of enzymes, they actually use the enzyme to do the hard work. And we'll see how that goes. So what I'm talking about, first of all, it is what's called sequential displacement. So sequential displacement, by the way, I want you to remember this. All enzymes are binding to substrates reversibly and non-covalently. They bound to a substrate covalently. They just killed the enzyme. So we've got an enzyme that binds a couple different substrates. Sequential displacement tells us that there's two different ways that sequential displacement can occur. I guess sequential displacement doesn't say that, but the, the scheme tells us that sequential displacement can, can occur in two ways. All right? The first is that the order matters. Okay? The order matters. This means that one molecule must bind before the other molecule does in order for the reaction to occur. An example of this is this um, uh, enzyme that catalyzes the reduction of pyruvate. Okay? This enzyme is known as lactate dehydrogenase. We'll talk about it uh, later in the term. This enzyme has an ordered sequential displacement, meaning that one molecule, I think it's the pyruvate, I can't remember, but one molecule must bind first before the reaction can occur. Now, I've already given you enough information for you to be able to envision why ordered binding might be necessary. What have you heard today that would tell us that ordered binding might be important for a multi-substrate enzyme? The what? The flexibility. the flexibility. Okay. And so what did the flexibility do? Okay. OK, so the binding of one might change the shape of the enzyme so that the other one now is able to bind. But if that first one doesn't bind, the shape isn't sufficiently close that the second one can bind at all. Make sense? That's very cool. Okay? It means that sequential binding or the uh, ordered binding in sequential displacement is very, very consistent with the Cochland induced fit model that we talked about. If you want evidence for the Cochlin induced fit model, all you have to talk about is ordered binding of substrates because there's no better example than that. Okay? Not all enzymes, however, use that. All right? Some enzymes, and here's a schematic. This actually tells us the order. I can't remember the order. Okay, NADH first. All right, that's fine. NADH, then pyruvate, <coughs> then lactate comes off, then NAD comes off. The important thing is that there's an order to it. It doesn't matter what the order is for our purposes, but rather that there's an order to it. Not all enzymes do ordered binding. Some do random binding. Here's an enzyme that's very important in muscles. It provides energy to muscles very quickly when they start running out of ATP. This enzyme is called creatine kinase. And it exhibits what we call random binding. Random binding means it doesn't matter which one binds first. The creatine combined, the ATP combined, and in either case, the reaction goes with the same rate. What does this tell us about this enzyme? Is the Cochlin induced fit model wrong for this enzyme? I see a no. Do I see any yeses? Nobody's getting sucked in on that one? It's not. It tells us, all this tells us 
is that the first one told us that the caution induced fit mo model had something to do with the substrate binding site. This simply says that the change that happens with the binding has nothing to do with the other binding site. But you can still have a flexible enzyme. You can still have things that change. The first one had a cause and effect. The binding of one caused the other binding site to change. This one says there's no cause and effect. This one binds. This one binds. Okay. The enzyme can still be flexible. The enzyme can still do its thing. But it's just that one is not dependent upon the other. Okay. So sequential displacement has two different mechanisms, one ordered, one random. And you've seen both of those now. Okay. Don't worry, and by the way, don't worry about the schematics. The schem when you look at this one, okay, that's really confusing. I mean, I, I couldn't interpret that if I had to sit there and do it with you. So let's not worry about the schematics. But I just put them there because your book puts them there. Now, the last mechanism that I want to talk about for multi-substrate binding by an enzyme is yet another mechanism. And this is the one that I said that the enzyme plays a role. It almost plays a role as a messenger. Okay. This one is usually the hardest one for students to understand because the enzyme is doing something different than the enzyme in the other two reactions. The enzyme is changing between two different forms. So double displacement reactions are also called ping pong reactions. You'll see why it's called ping pong in just a second. Okay. Here's a reaction catalyzed by um, a typical ping pong mechanism. This is a reaction of an enzyme known as transaminase. Transaminase catalyzes the following thing. It catalyzes the exchange of this amine that you see on aspartate with this oxygen that you see on alpha ketoglutarate. You see after this exchange has occurred, aspartate has been converted into oxaloacetate and alpha ketoglutarate has been converted into glutamate. <laughs> I guess we're stuck. Okay. <laughs> the temperature in here will be getting warmer, won't it? <laughs> it's probably getting warmer out there right now. Okay. So, what we're doing is we're swapping. So, think about it. we're swapping this with this. Okay. Yep. Oh, thank you. I didn't know they took the, they took the chair from your office. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank, thank you much. <laughs> okay. We're swapping this amine with this oxygen. <coughs> now, all that's happening in this reaction is that the enzyme is being the carrier. First, let's say the enzyme starts out, it has an oxygen that it's carrying. The enzyme takes that oxygen and it gives it to the aspartate and it takes away the nitrogen and now the enzyme has a nitrogen on it. The enzyme takes the nitrogen and gives it to alpha ketoglutarate and takes away its oxygen. Everybody see what's happened? Enzyme started with oxygen, it got nitrogen, it donated nitrogen, it got oxygen back. The enzyme existed in two states. One state that had nitrogen and one state that had oxygen. It's ping-ponging. When it's got nitrogen, it interacts with things that have oxygen. When it has oxygen, it interacts with things that have nitrogen. Back and forth. We didn't see that in the other reactions that we talked about. We did not see that in the other reactions that we talked about. Okay? The enzyme was only in one state. It catalyzed the reaction, it let everything go. But now the enzyme is the carrier. Back and forth, back and forth. Swap nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen. That's what a ping pong mechanism does. Questions? Everybody understood that? I know I'm not that clear. Okay, well, I'll take your word on it that I'm that clear. All right, um, double displacement. You want to see an ugly <coughs> schematic, take a look at this guy. Okay, that's not good either. Okay, all right, now, that's what happens um, with um, enzymes.
we've talked about how enzymes catalyze reactions, and there's a thing on there about allosteric enzyme kinetics, and actually maybe I will show you that briefly. I wasn't going to show you that, but I happen to find what an allosteric enzyme is, and you won't need to know this definition for this exam, but you will need to know it for the second exam. An allosteric enzyme is an enzyme whose activity changes as a result of binding to a molecule. The enzyme's activity changes as a result of binding to a molecule. You've already seen one protein whose behavior changed in binding to a molecule. What was it? It was hemoglobin. Hemoglobin had cooperativity. It bound one oxygen. That made it more favorable to bind a second, more favorable to bind a third, etc. Its affinity for oxygen was changing the more oxygen that it bound. Okay. Well, not surprisingly, when we look at allosteric enzymes and we plot velocity versus substrate concentration, I will ask you, what's the shape of that plot? It's sigmoidal, just like we saw with hemoglobin. On hemoglobin, we were plotting the percent oxygen bound. Here we're plotting velocity, and we see the same sort of plot. Is there a relationship between the two? Do you suppose? Well, you'd be logically look at that and say, yeah, probably so. Then you start scratching your head and going, well, why is there, why are these two similar? The answer, in the case of hemoglobin, it's simply binding to oxygen. It's not catalyzing a reaction. Hemoglobin is not an enzyme. It's simply binding to oxygen. Allosteric enzymes are enzymes. They do catalyze reactions, but in order to catalyze reactions, what do they have to do? They have to bind substrate, just like hemoglobin has to bind to oxygen. So what we're seeing reflected in the activity is the same thing that happens in the binding that we only saw happening in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin did the first part. It bound. It just didn't catalyze a reaction. OK. All right. Well, we've got enzymes working nicely. Now we have to do something about inhibiting them. Oh, God. You take something we're beginning to understand, you take concepts we're beginning to understand, and now you're going to screw it all up by inhibiting enzymes. Okay? Well, that's where we're at here, and that's what we're going to finish up with today. Okay? Enzymes can be inhibited. And understanding enzyme inhibition is actually a very, very important concept for anybody interested in any aspect of healthcare. Why? When I look at drugs, a lot of drugs act as enzymatic inhibitors. So we need to understand some of the parameters involved in inhibiting those enzymes. I'm going to talk in this class about two classes of enzyme inhibitors. The first class is what I call competitive inhibitors. The second class, what I call non-competitive inhibitors. And they're very different in how they, how they work. This schematic shows us a an enzyme binding to its substrate. You might look at this and say, that's sort of a, that's sort of a Fisher model, right? We have everything bound. Although I guess it's kind of hard to say. It's, it's already bound, so maybe the changes have already happened in this, in this one. When I compare that to a competitive <coughs> inhibitor, notice that the competitive inhibitor looks very much like the natural substrate. It has the same shape. It binds at the active site very much like the normal substrate did. A competitive inhibitor, there's a very important characteristic, a competitive inhibitor resembles the natural substrate. And because it resembles the natural substrate, it can bind to the active site. It actually competes with the natural substrate for the active site. They're both competing for the same site. Okay. That's one type of inhibition. A second type of, in, uh, of inhibition, we're not going to talk about uncompetitive, so you can leave the middle one out there. All right. A second type of inhibition is called non-competitive. Non-competitive is shown here. Okay? The non-competitive inhibitor on this figure is the little rod over here on the left part of the enzyme. Notice that the non-competitive inhibitor does not look like the substrate. It is not competing 
with the substrate for the active site. But what it's doing is it's binding to a different site on the enzyme, and as a result, it's changing the enzyme so the enzyme can no longer work on the substrate. The binding of the non-competitive inhibitor stopped the enzyme from working properly on the substrate. In either case, the non-competitive inhibitor and the competitive inhibitor are each stopping the enzyme from functioning. Both inhibitors, and this is again a point of confusion, both inhibitors work reversibly. They do not make covalent bonds with the enzyme. They, work, they bind and they let go. For some types of anti-cancer drugs, that's a very important consideration because we kill cells if we don't make them let go. One of those anti-cancer drugs is actually shown right here, methotrexate. Methotrexate is, oop, getting some dust in there, yep. Methotrexate is a, an anti-cancer drug. It's used for other purposes as well, but one of the purposes is used to kill cancer cells. It resembles the natural substrate that cells use called dihydrofolate. Dihydrofolate is needed by cells to make nucleotides. Methotrexate was designed to bind to that enzyme that, that uses dihydrofolate and basically stop the enzyme from functioning. It has to be reversible. If it binds to the enzyme and never lets go, the cell that gets it dies. Well, that's great if it's a cancer cell, but what if it's not a cancer cell? Ah! We don't want to lose that. So one of the treatments of methotrexate for a tumor therapy is to give methotrexate for a period of time and then withdraw it. And in withdrawing it, replacing it with natural substrate, the cells that have survived that treatment are allowed to live. Those that didn't survive that treatment are probably dividing more rapidly, cancer cells, for example, and probably died. That reversibility of that inhibition is very important, especially here. It inhibits, yeah, it inhibits a very critical reaction in the formation of nucleotides. That's correct. Now, let's think about the kinetics of these things now. All right? These inhibitors affect the kinetic parameters that we've talked about. They inhibit v, they, they affect Vmax. They affect Km. Okay? This is a confusing figure. It shows several different concentrations of enzyme inhibitor. For our purposes, we're only going to follow this very top one right here, the top green one, all right? This guy right here. What we have, a black line that shows us the enzyme, the V versus S plot for an enzyme that had no inhibition whatsoever. We did 20 reactions, we had 20 tubes, we had no inhibitor, and we saw V versus S, what we saw before. The green line, we took 20 tubes. We used the same concentrations of substrate. We used the same concentrations, that is, for each tube as we did before, the same concentrations of enzyme as we did before, but into each tube, and this is very important, we put the exact same concentration of inhibitor. We didn't increase the inhibitor. So we're increasing the substrate in each tube, but we are not increasing the inhibitor. The inhibitor is staying at the same exact concentration throughout. What this figure is showing us, and you can ignore this thing on the top. I'm not going to talk about this up here at all. I want you to focus on these two curves. Forget these two below. They're just different concentrations of inhibitor. All right? Uninhibited black, inhibited green. Okay? What's happening to the Vmax of this reaction? It's lower at the same substrate. At the same substrate concentration, it's lower, but we can see that it's actually rising, 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 and it turns out that it will eventually intersect with that black line, because the black line itself is, low, is, is flattening. We just learned that competitive inhibitors do not change the Vmax for a reaction. Now, I'm going to tell you why that is in a second, but that's the first observation. Competitive inhibitors do not change the Vmax for a reaction. What's the substrate concentration at Vmax, folks? Infinite, saturated, right? How much inhibitor did I put into each reaction? A fixed amount, right? 
If I'm down over here, I might, for example, have a thousand molecules of substrate and 50 molecules of inhibitor. That's 5%. Up here, I might have a million molecules of substrate and 50 molecules of inhibitor. What's going to be the likelihood they're both going to bind to the active site? Well, the natural substrate is going to have a likelihood of a million to 50 more likely to bind to the active site than the inhibitor is. At high concentrations, the inhibitor will essentially be invisible. It will be outcompeted. It gets outcompeted by the substrate because they're both competing for the active site. It's a numbers game. The one guy wins the race, the other one doesn't. The Vmax stays the same because at infinite concentration, which is way over here, okay, there's essentially, effectively, no inhibitor. Okay? Down here, there's more inhibitor. If we were to plot the Km for this reaction, what would we see? Well, Km is Vmax over 2, so if Vmax is, is 100, Vmax over 2 is going to be 50 right here. If I look at the substrate concentration necessary to get the uninhibited reaction <coughs> to Vmax over 2, it's right there. It's going to take greater substrate concentration to get the inhibited reaction to Vmax over 2. Km is going up. The apparent affinity of the enzyme for the substrate is increasing. Why? Because the inhibitor is gumming up some of the enzyme. You say, but it doesn't stay permanently, but on, on average, a certain percentage of those enzymes are going to be gummed up at that point. It comes off of one, it goes on to another. We've effectively, at this concentration, reduced the enzyme concentration. We reduce the concentration, what happens to velocity? Velocity goes down. Up here, we haven't effectively reduced the concentration because essentially everything is binding to substrate, nothing is being inhibited. We have 100% enzyme activity up here. Down here, the lower we go, the more effective the inhibitor is and the more of an effect that we see on the velocity. Now, let's contrast that with a non-competitive inhibitor. A non-competitive inhibitor is not competing with the enzyme for the active site. Okay? And no matter how much I add substrate, I cannot block the inhibitor from finding the other site on the enzyme. I can't block it, no matter what I do. Adding more substrate will not overcome the non-competitive inhibitor. What that means it, then is that at any concentration of substrate, I will always have the same fixed percentage of enzyme that's being inhibited. If I started out with 50% inhibition, I will end up with 50% inhibition. The substrate concentration will have nothing to do with it. In the first case, the amount of enzyme that was active varied. Low concentration of substrate, more inhibited enzyme. High concentration of substrate, no inhibited enzyme. Here, at every substrate concentration, the same percentage of enzyme is inhibited. What do we learn about Vmax relative to velocity? Uh, I'm sorry, relative to um, enzyme concentration. <coughs> if I reduce the amount of enzyme present, what's going to happen to Vmax? It's going to fall. So I've just told you I have a fixed percentage. I have effectively killed 50% of the enzyme in this case. I'm going to see, in this case, a Vmax that's 50% of what it was up here. So non-competitive inhibition will have a reduced Vmax compared to an uninhibited reaction. Now, what will surprise you is the fact that the Km does not change. The Km of a non-competitively inhibited reaction does not change compared to a um, uh, reaction that has um, uh, no inhibitor. Now, that is the difference between a non-competitive and a competitive inhibition. Right? Now, there are some plots, there are some plots uh, relating to this called Lineweaver-Burke. I've decided I'm not going to go through those for this exam. I will take any quick questions that you have, and then I have a song that will tie everything together for you, hopefully. Other questions on this? <coughs>
I want you to think and digest this tonight, because I, again, I've thrown a lot of concepts at you today, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have here. Yes? So what's on the first Everything through today, everything where I'm stopping right here. Okay. okay? So where I'm stopping here will be what's on the exam on Wednesday. So what will happen is there will still be some more things about enzymes that I will talk about after uh, this. I'll talk about them tomorrow, but they will be on the second exam, not on this exam. What's that? Just the concept of Gibbs free energy. You're not going to do any calculations of Gibbs free energy. Okay. Just the concept is all. Okay. Let's do a song. I've got a song. It's actually, this is the most popular song that gets downloaded from my website. And um, I think you'll see why. It describes enzymes to you. It's called enzymes. It's to the tune of an old song popular back when I was a child called Downtown. Anybody know the song Downtown? Oh yeah, okay. Da 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 So let's make this campy. So when we get to the downtown part, or get to the enzymes part, I want you to shout it out. We're gonna wake up Strand Egg Hall. Ready? Okay. Reactions alone can starve your cells to the bone. Thank God we all produce enzymes. Units arranged to make the chemicals change because you always use Enzymes. Sometimes mechanisms run like they are at the races. Witness the cake hat of the carbonic anhydrases. How do they work? Inside of the active side, it just grabs onto a substrate and squeezes it tight in an enzyme. Catalysis in an enzyme. V versus S in an enzyme. All of this working for you. Enzyme, enzyme. Energy peaks are what an enzyme defeats in its catalysis. Enzymes. Transition state is what an enzyme does great, and you should all know this. Enzymes. Catalytic action won't run wild, don't get hysteric. Cells can throttle pathways with an enzyme allosteric. You know it's true. When a, so when an effector fits, it will just rearrange all the subunits inside an enzyme. Flipping from R to T, enzyme. Slow catalytically, enzyme. No change in delta G, enzyme, enzyme. You should relax when seeking out the Vmax, though there are many steps. Enzymes. Lineweaver Burke can save a scientist work with just two intercepts. Enzymes. Plotting all the data from kinetic exploration lets you match a line into a best fitting equation. Here's what you do. Both axes are inverted, then you can determine Vmax and establish Km for your enzymes. Sterically holding tight enzymes, substrates positioned right enzymes, inside the active site enzymes, enzymes. All right. You'll hear about Langweaver Burke tomorrow. Yes. <laughs>